In this Industrial Sage episode, we're going to talk with Derek Grove White from LJ Welding in Canada. And so he's going to share with us his experiences on working with LJ Welding and going from that traditional sense of marketing over to digital. He's got a lot of great information that he's going to go over about you know, what they learned, how they decided to actually make that shift, why they decided to do that. Uh, and different things that they, they did back then, things they're doing now. You're not going to want to miss this episode. There's a lot of information you're going to be able to get out of this. I'm Dana Gonzalez, and this is Industrial Sage. Dara, thanks so much for joining us uh, on this episode of Industrial Sage. And so before we kind of like kick things off, we'd just love for you, if you could introduce yourself to the audience, tell us a little bit about yourself and a little about, about uh, LJ, uh, LJ Welding. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so my name is Dara. I, uh, I live in Canada, Victoria, British Columbia. Um, I have been a marketing director for LJ Welding for the last two years. Um, I've been doing marketing online for about eight years. Um, and LJ Welding is an industrial automation manufacturer. They're based out of Edmonton, Alberta. Okay. And they, up until uh, 2008, and actually even the most recent crash, um, they were largely an oil and gas mm -hmm. uh, equipment manufacturer. And in the last few years, they've really had to branch out into new industry, entirely new industries, uh, uh, which now include, uh, I, I can't say we, we legally signed agreement not to say the specific names of some of the companies, but I can tell you they are putting things into space and they're not, and it's not just NASA that is a customer of ours. That's so exciting. Yeah, of uh, just some of the interesting players that we get to work with. Um, and yeah, so uh, welding automation, mm -hmm. uh, as you're probably very aware, uh, automation has taken a lot of people's jobs. So uh, <laughs> getting buy-in from end users that feel threatened that the equipment is taking their job away is mm. one of the many complexities of marketing uh, today, uh, particularly with LJ Welding. Um, but it's also largely B2B. So mm -hmm. Although we do a little bit of uh, business to consumer uh, with some of our smaller products, we're typically selling to uh, about six distinct buyer personas. And I like the fact that you said that you're selling to six personas. That tells me there's a little bit of strategy behind that and there's a little bit of thought to, hey, we're just selling to all these different people. Um, so I like that. Maybe tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, there, I, I make the distinction of personas as well as the distinction of industries. Mm -hmm. So we're not just um, helping uh, oil and gas. We're helping, uh, and th there's actually quite a lot of different sub-industries within oil and gas. Sure, absolutely, yeah. Uh, but also military, um, Navy, uh, nuclear power, uh, all kinds of different industries. But we were able to notice that there are patterns of buyer personas. And these buyer personas uh, would be project managers that really basically have the same function, but they're really in different uh, industries. Mm -hmm. but they, they operate the same way as in buying behavior. Yeah. So um, the personas I can tell you about would be like the welder end user, mm -hmm. uh, the business owner, the project manager, project engineer, um, process engineer, yeah. and health and safety uh, role. So just as an example of a few of the personas that we're dealing with. Right. So, and they all have their different uh, pain points. Yes. Distinct pain points, mm -hmm. uh, motivations for why they buy, mm -hmm. um, and things that whenever like a lead comes in, I make sure that my salespeople know what the personas mean. So they know specifically the types of generalities we're making about these buyers. Right. So if it's a, like, for instance, a purchaser or a buyer, um, their pain points are often around the supplier. Are they on time? Uh, mm -hmm. Did they back up the price unexpectedly? <laughs> yeah. Are they reliable? These are different pain points than, say, the business owner, who really, his biggest pain point is, are we making this more profit? Is this more profitable? Where's the waste? Are we cutting it? Yeah. yeah. So if I was to talk to the business owner about the buyer purchaser pain points, that wouldn't have the same effect on them as if I was talking to them like a business owner. Exactly. Like, hey, we're going to um, we're going to eliminate some waste. 
we're going to improve your throughput. Uh, we're going to up your cycle times, um, improve your cycle times. These are the things that he cares about that I wouldn't say to the purchaser. We call her purchaser Pam. Sure. Just that, that generality, because um, she doesn't really, uh, she doesn't give a care about these things. <laughs> right. So. Right. No, this is all great stuff. As I think. I got all excited about this. It, 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 we kind of, I kind of jumped the gun a little bit on here. One thing, but before, um, what I think is important is I think a lot. Of, there's a lot of organizations, uh, a lot of manufacturing industrial companies that are saying, "Hey, yeah, they're recognizing, yeah, we need to be able to make this 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 transition and 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 go from maybe that traditional sense of marketing over to digital." And certainly, you know, persona development is a massive component of it. But maybe you could walk me through a little bit of that story. What's the LJ Welding story on how? They came to the realization saying, you know what, I think we need to look at going more digitally. What did that look like? Um, and and kind of how did that happen? Walk us through that story. Well, they uh, the guys uh, bought LJ Welding from uh, Larry John, I believe his name was. <laughs> uh, but the company itself is about 40 years old. Okay, yeah. And they bought it a little over 10 years ago from him. Okay, and yeah. And when they first bought it, uh, he only did business in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. uh, he had these pipeline rollers. He didn't really, it was in one bay of a garage. And now it's the two giant facilities doing business in 45 countries around the world. Um, and uh, the, big, the big secret is in the internet marketing, really, mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Um, they, they were originally turned on to... Like there wasn't even a website when they first bought wow. the business. Wow. Um, and he was using flyers. Okay. Uh, and he, he just had a select few mm -hmm. people that he was doing business with. So from from that kind of business to, you know, we we spend several thousand dollars a month on just Google AdWords now. That, mm -hmm. I, that I oversee. That's not including Facebook ads. And, sure. Uh, LinkedIn and I mean Reddit is also a really great Reddit. Place. Interesting. Okay. Uh, we get some of our cheapest traffic, uh, in, or least expensive traffic, to our blogs and stuff like that from Reddit. Mm. Um, I could probably talk five minutes about little <laughs> tricks on Reddit for how to basically leverage it, it as a platform um, because it's a great place to get traffic, uh, views on uh, eyeballs on your content, yeah. which then increases your search ranking, mm -hmm. which then strengthens your keywords, yeah. uh, your keyword rank, which then means that you have a lower cost per click for those keywords. So yeah. you're it's part of a bit of a more um, holistic strategy. Absolutely. Anyway, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going on a bit of a tangent, and I want to answer your question for you before I go on another one. No, it's all good. No, so I mean, um, but you said they didn't have a website, and you know they were doing flyers and stuff. So what was that? What was that aha moment, or that hey, I think we need to try something a little bit different. So well, I guess when they bought the company, did they come into it saying we're going to take this a whole different direction and we're going digital, or was it something that was that was something that kind of was. Uh, uh, picked up on at some point, and said, "Hey, maybe we should investigate." I think I think your audience can probably relate to this. Uh, I know I can, as I've gotten older, and the, the owners have kind of mentored me. Mm -hmm. um, is they they were looking for an unsexy business mm -hmm. because it's the 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 widget types of businesses, the in, the industrial types of. Mm -hmm. Um, they're not usually considered sexy businesses. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it also makes them, in a sense, a better business because mm -hmm. they're not going to be. Um, swayed so easily by trends and stuff like that, right? Right, yeah. So when they took it over, they, they realized, hey, we need to have like a, some kind of web presence. Mm -hmm. So they ended up getting a website and they didn't do a great deal with it. They, it, like most businesses, they used it as a kind of online mailbox mm -hmm. for incoming leads and also for where people can see pictures of the, the products and read the specs if they don't want to necessarily order the catalog. Mm -hmm. um, but it was also, they, they got it onto Google AdWords before the, their competitors started to. Ah, uh, okay. They were, they were getting, that was, I think, one of the main reasons behind getting the website. Yeah. Because they saw that there was this really great opportunity in Google AdWords where they were able to get this mass amounts of uh, targeted traffic for, uh, for pennies. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at least at the time now, you know. A little like, different now. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're paying a few bucks for keywords. Right, yeah. You know? Um, and that doesn't guarantee that they're going to turn into a lead. Right, right. Um, you know, so, uh, mm -hmm. and our cost per lead is pretty high. Yeah. Uh, when we add up all of the, all of our different 
cost. I mean, for a good qualified lead, a market marketing qualified lead. Mm-hmm. Well, um, but anyway, so they, they got the website. It was very basic. Um, and they really were using it just to get use Google AdWords uh, for, and they competitors didn't catch on for a couple of years. So they, they really got a head start and they really uh, started to uh, build up their business to what would end up being a 30 some odd million dollar a year revenue company employing 80 plus people. So that, that's awesome. That's, where they are at now, but. Uh, that's an awesome story. That's, that's really cool. So obviously over the years, things have changed a little bit. And so I imagine the strategies are a little bit more, you know, it's not, as you mentioned, you know, maybe not just PPC or different things, but um, you know, so uh, walk me through a little bit of maybe some of that organizational buy-in a little bit there, where it sounded like there was, was there some toe dipping involved? It sounded like there was a, you know, a little bit of an iterative, iter, iter, iterative process, I can't talk, uh, and on how, you know, I said, okay, we got to do the website. I, I, we got to do the website because we need to do PPC. But, you know, what, what was that? Was that it? Like, was that it, it for them? Or was there a longer term strategy? They... Um, before I came on board, they were starting to realize the importance of really upping their online game. Okay. And they ended up producing six blogs or eight blogs or something like that. Okay. Which were they're all right. Yeah. Um, but the, they didn't have any of the marketing thinking behind it, so they okay. were just producing content to produce it. Yeah. They weren't actually asking what are our customers asking us all the time mm. that we may want to have some frequently asked question content. Yeah. Um, so they were. Instead of testing, checking with their market first, they just produced content, and it was okay. Um, it, like it, it still gets views, yeah. but it, it's not, it's not a really strong content. Mm-hmm. And around that time, I was, uh, I was just finishing my university degree, and I was, I was doing a co-op, mm-hmm. kind of like an internship with LJ, and uh, I had just finished a course, a free course that anybody can do, which I would strongly recommend. Uh, called HubSpot inbound certification. Mm-hmm. And Never heard of them. I'm, I'm just playing. Just totally playing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, so anyway, I did the course, and I realized by going because I always, uh, like I said, I've always loved marketing. Yeah. And I, I kind of knew that that was sort of the direction I wanted to go. To be a really, really good marketer, you have to first be good at sales. Mm-hmm. And I've been doing sales mm-hmm. for, I mean, probably close to 15 years now. But mm-hmm. um, it, when my first jobs ever were always sales. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, so I knew I wanted to get into marketing. I took this HubSpot uh, certification, and I realized all these gaps everywhere in what we were doing. Well, we didn't have a clear ROI on our our ad spend to leads. We weren't tracking. Uh, we, we basically weren't tracking. The only thing that we were kind of tracking was the amount of leads coming in. Yeah. And then that wasn't being properly tracked. We weren't <laughs> distinguishing the them from people that just wanted to be contacted mm-hmm. versus people who had legitimate quotes. Right. And, and the trouble is, uh, as, as someone who, as a professional, if you're not able to track things, you can't improve things because you haven't yeah. been tracked. Exactly. And that was the first big, big, big uh, red flag that needed to be addressed. And that was something that I did. Mm. I essentially created my marketing director position because the person who was doing the marketing was also the COO who was closing the most deals a day. So he didn't really have time for marketing, but he knew yeah. he needed it. Yeah. So they, they had things like Google Analytics set up, but they didn't even know how to use it. Yeah. And it wasn't correctly installed. Um, they, didn't, they weren't tracking conversions in any way. Um, so there was, there was basically a lot of work to do. And the trouble is when you don't have everything properly measured, you're essentially throwing a lot of money in a black hole yeah. because you don't know what's going on and yeah. you're just throwing money and it's hemorrhaging. And it's, um, I, I said this to you earlier, like good marketing is expensive. Yeah. Yeah, it good is. Marketing yeah. Is even more expensive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because of you having to redo it mm-hmm. and then getting the good marketer in, you exactly. know, so it's better just to do a great job up front and be willing to, you know, take the hit. Right. Because in the long term, it, it's going to pay off. So LJ was really using um, an agency. I won't say the name of the agency, um, sure. but I, I also would recommend them. Yeah. Um, the in a, in a, uh, close close to where they were, uh, who was managing a, a fairly expensive. They they basically were the de facto marketing director company for LJ before I came on board. Mm-hmm. And I 
ended up having to, I mean, for lack of a better word, tidy up what sure. they started. Yeah. And um, just to make it more, because as, as you know, and the people out that are listening, uh, when you're in industrial marketing, you've got a lot of really niche keywords. Yeah. Or niche, as you guys say over there. <laughs> Depends. Yeah, we can go both ways on that. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and when you hand that over to an agency, they don't, they don't get the way that your customers talk. Right. They don't. Right. They only your salespeople really do know that. Yeah. Because they're always interacting with your customer every day. Mm-hmm. If you're if you're using an agency for your uh, PPC mm-hmm. and they aren't asking enough questions about your customers, yeah, that that should be a red flag. Uh, and the trouble is they weren't. And we were getting, although we were getting a lot of traffic to the website, it was not targeted traffic. They mm-hmm. weren't using. They weren't even asking us about. Um, adding negative keywords into oh wow yeah they were they were really just they were doing the bare minimum because they could see LJ was already doing great on its own yeah and they were like oh we're and just they, keep I, riding this huh when I was reflecting on some of their reports and I was looking at it myself they were they were doing some stuff with the metrics that wasn't necessarily 100 percent accurate mm. they were blending um, metrics together to make it look better yeah. But when you actually separated it, you saw what was going on. Yeah. And they were taking credit for things that, and this is one of the things that uh, companies do need to watch out for uh, when they're getting, um, when they're looking into uh, right. getting an agency to help in any form. Yeah. You, you'll, you'll know this well. I mean, you probably have to clean up a lot of messes too. Um, yeah, a little bit. That, that, <laughs> that could definitely be part of it. Yep. So let me ask you this. So you said, but the, with the results, you know, there, that, that was an issue. What, what was one of the first things you implemented then to be able to, to, to say, okay, look, we need to be look, measuring this stuff a little bit better so we can have a better understanding of, you know, what's going, what, what you know, what did that look like? So the, uh, we started doing like link tracking. Okay. Our call to actions got links tracking. So like, are you were using like, like UTM, like uh, codes or were you using like I, bit.ly, I, I, you know? Even easier, HubSpot's got a way that you can just um, track links based on okay, yeah, whatever the sources are, and so that was important. Another really one thing I would really recommend to everybody listening is if you have one landing page where you do your fill in your quotes, mm-hmm. stop doing that from here on out. <laughs> yeah. Instead, have a bunch of different landing pages for different p- product groups that you have. Mm-hmm. Because this way you can put um, uh, tracking pixels in yeah. for remarketing later. Right. Um, it just it makes it really clean. Right. And it makes sure that you're not marketing remarketing to someone who's not interested in your product because then you're wasting your money. Exactly. You're, yeah. You're potentially losing some some brand value with that that right. potential. So making sure that um, your landing pages are product or even industry specific. Right. So that they're only seeing the stuff they're interested in. So it goes kind of back to the personas we were talking about there a little bit, making sure that we're talking to the right people to have the right challenges and, and yeah, you be as- the right stuff in front of the right people. Exactly. Um, yeah. And so one of the things that we were originally doing was we just had two uh, pages. They weren't even landing pages. They were just web pages. Yeah. One for the the quote and then one for contact us. And so I I went in and I turned them into landing pages. And uh, for viewers who aren't sure what the difference is. Uh, a landing page has no navigation mm-hmm. on it. It's just one button and maybe a video if you're smart. Uh, if not, it could be like a hero image and like some bullet points saying what the benefits are, mm-hmm. why you should ask, why you should give them your email. That's a landing page. And the the philosophy behind that is you want to get rid of as many distractions as possible mm-hmm. to get the visitor on that page to do exactly what you want them to do. Right. In, in essence, convert. So um, the quote section did not was not a landing page so people could lose their their attention span would move on to something else and they wouldn't actually submit a quote mm. so you just want to make it uh, as easy as possible for people re- remove as much what's called cognitive friction as possible uh, distractions and reasons for people to hold off you want to remove those so I did that um, but then I created several landing pages for different products mm-hmm. like I said for the for the reason that I want to make sure that I'm I'm targeting them but it also makes it easier to figure out what products or groupings were converting better than other groupings mm-hmm. and that I could do little experiments along the way to just constantly be improving. Now my, my average conversion rate on my RFQ page, my request for quote page, mm-hmm. 
is about 30%. Wow. That's pretty damn good. That is very damn good. Uh, yeah. Is 50%. yeah. So, um, but yeah, uh, but, but these are things that you got to track. So right. like how well is, how well is your landing page mm-hmm. where you're getting that quote to come in? Hopefully mm-hmm. how well is that converting? Yeah. If it's, if it's under 10%, you need to, you need to go back to the drawing board mm-hmm. or you need to figure out how the traffic, what kind of traffic's going to it right. and then adjust where necessary. But I would say just in general terms, a uh, 20% conversion rate on a landing page uh, is acceptable. It, it, it then becomes a lower priority and there's probably other places that you need to spend your time. Sure. If you're already getting a 20% landing page conversion. So 20% landing page conversion. All right. That's the target. So there's a lot of great information or, you know, to kind of recap even a little bit here, a lot of great nuggets of information um, or bigger than just nuggets. But a big thing is obviously the results tracking, making sure that you are actually measuring your activity because like you said, you cannot improve what you can't measure. You need a baseline. We need to figure out what that is, look at it, and then you can make an assessment from there. Uh, um, also, uh, making sure that, you know, uh, in, in that note, I, you said something else too. It was, it was uh, basically A-B testing, testing stuff, seeing what works. Again, it goes back to the measurement. You have to measure that to be able to, be able to see that. But, you know, let's try this. Let's look at, now let's try this over here and let's look at it. Let's analyze and let, let's kind of, you know, move from there. Um, and then I love the, 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 to the, the piece about having, you know, different landing pages and making sure that on those landing pages that we're speaking, we're really going to focus on those to a specific persona and, 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 or, you know, whether it's vertical or persona, the pain points. Um, and then, you know, being able to use that to, so we can have uh, a good retargeting strategy that is very relevant to that person, you know, later on down the line. Um, and there's you know, a bunch of other things you said in there too, though, that, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, Definitely the landing page piece where, you know, the difference between a page and a landing page, take away all that navigation, really just focus in on that call to action. This is what we want you to do. Let's go. No cat videos. No, you know, none of, like this is boom. Give me your email and your phone number because my salespeople are going to contact you. <laughs> that's all I really, at the end of the day, that's, uh, it's our jobs as marketers is to get qualified leads, mm-hmm. not get leads, not just qualify. Yes but right. get qualified leads. So by the time it comes to the sales, um, sales knows, like I, I want to equip my salesperson with as much information as possible. Yeah. Um, so that they, like if, now that they know what persona they're dealing with before they even speak with them. Yeah. Like, oh, this is a purchaser Pam or this is a superintendent Samuel. Um, they know a welder William. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I love them all right, but yeah. uh, they know how to talk to them. Yeah. Cause you don't want to. And so just equipping. So here's just one other little conversion tip and I can, I can give you a hundred. <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm sensing that. This is great. But, but uh, one, one big conversion tip is if you're finding that uh, your conversion rates aren't where you want them to be yet, uh, consider reducing the amount of questions you're asking them in mm-hmm. that form mm-hmm. or make, or, um, embolden the value that they're getting in exchange for that. So, uh, so the, it's basically, it's a bit of a balance, right? Yeah. So if you're giving like a, a, a free ebook on how to save a thousand dollars a month, mm-hmm. that's worth a lot of money. If it actually, you know, uh, if it, if it lives up to its promise, <laughs> Yeah. so you can ask for a lot of information because mm-hmm. you're saving the person $12,000 a year. Yeah. Yeah. So they're like, yeah, I would pay you money for this. This is free. Of course I'm going to give you all these details. Exactly. But if you're, but in the case where, say you're you're doing an RFQ, uh, re- you're trying to get somebody to request a quote, mm-hmm. so you can get the quote and then uh, get your salesperson to call, contact them. This is really important, and it's kind of hard to you know embolden that value. So because it's everybody else is giving a quote too, all your right. competitors. Yeah. So by asking, if you're finding your conversion rate isn't there yet, consider asking less questions, mm. but make sure that you know the the critical ones like their phone number. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, their email, um, their name, obviously, uh, the product that they're interested in, um, and ideally the company they're they're with. If it's not obvious in their email, I mean, just make sure that you get their company anyway. Sure. Yeah. Um, but then the things that you may want to start considering adding on for your salesperson mm-hmm. is what's the price range that this person thinks it's going to cost, right? And have some you know reasonable price ranges that if they if they want to, they can let you know what they think mm-hmm. the price that they've got budgeted or expectations because then your salesperson is able to go in and be like, 
this person really doesn't know the value of the product yet. Yeah. So I'm going to have to do a really big job on showing value. Yes. It, yeah. you're not, or uh, if, if they're overvaluing it, that's great because then your salesperson's like, hey. You're set up for success there. This is, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You're, you're giving your salesperson a little more information so that they have a, yeah. an even better uh, job up, up front. It makes their job even easier. Like I always, I always everybody does. This. We, we all go back to the example of, say, Apple or Tesla, mm -hmm. uh, where, where you're looking at examples of really good marketing. Mm -hmm. Where there's really good marketing, your salesperson's job should be a little bit more than a cashier. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. For a really bad marketing job, your salesperson <laughs> has to be close to a used car salesman, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, so I take a lot of ownership uh, in the success of my company because as as their head marketer, really, um, I'm a one-man show. Um, well, I, 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 I talk with our sales team and if they're having, if they're getting, if they're letting me know of friction points uh, that they're experiencing, that, that's potentially a new blog uh, piece uh, that we can talk about. Um, but my job is to make the salespeople's job even easier. Yeah. At the end of the day. That's awesome. And that's, that's a great, I love that because, you know, I also, you also see, there's always a lot of friction between marketing and sales. And sometimes you know, there's, oh, you know, I can't, marketing's doing this. I don't know why the heck they did this. And, and, that, and that, I think that's, that is a, a, just a great sign. This is where it really needs to be is really having that great relationship between sales and marketing. You said something earlier about, um, you know, uh, that really a marketer should be really good at sales. Uh, so understanding the cadence, understanding the language, understanding the needs, like what are our customers are looking at? What are their biggest challenges? What are their needs? And a lot of times it, sales has, they have that information because they're dealing with them every single day. So have that relationship, have that connection to be able to get that information if you don't have that yourself. So you can help make their job easier. I love how you said, you know, you're giving them a lot of intelligence, a lot of information, so that, that when they pick up the phone, they're not you know, flying blind into this thing. They, they've got a lot of information. Okay, this person's in this vertical. They're you know, prepared to buy. Here's the budget range that they think, so we're gonna have to go this direction versus that direction. And now we're just gonna help sort of facilitate that, you know, just kind of bring them in for the landing. You know, it's really nice. We've, we're already lined up. You know, we're on final approach. We just gotta like, bring this thing and have a nice smooth landing. So I love it. This is awesome. Um, so, this has been a, just an absolutely fantastic conversation, and there's been a, just a wealth of information here. We're probably going to have to do a follow-up at some point later down the road. It seems like I, I was really intrigued by this, the, the, the Reddit piece. That's the first I've heard. Do you want me to give a few nuggets on that right now? or we, we, You know, we could go for a, a little bit. I think we've got a few, few more minutes before you know, we run out of time here. But anyway, okay. talk about it for a second. Yeah, what, okay. I mean, how'd you find Reddit, that? And how'd you discover Reddit, that? Uh, Reddit's a bit of an anomaly. Uh, it's, it's its own ecosystem, and before uh, going too hard into advertising in there, uh, get to understand the ecosystem. Uh, it's and it also know your know your audience. So if you're, um, it's predominantly males on Reddit. Mm -hmm. uh, there, I think it's something like sixty some odd percent. Mm -hmm. So it's if you're if you're trying to sell to women, market um, Reddit could potentially help you, but just keep in mind the ecosystem and mm -hmm. who's in it. Um, it's also um, the majority of people are under the age of 38. Okay. So it's a younger audience. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to sell retirement homes, it's not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. But I think you understand. Um, and also they, 81% the of them are moderate to liberal in their thinking, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. So that it's basically... Jokingly, it's a bunch of teenage boys. <laughs> no, totally not. And uh, you'll, uh, but, but just remember that your persona on Reddit, generally speaking, is going to be a younger male. Mm -hmm. Generally, um, so if if that's where your your um, one of your personas lands somewhere in there, that's that's great. And it turns out for us, uh, it often can, like project managers, end users. Um, and 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 the like so anyway uh for a few a few little nuggets for for reddit um one is the advertising is really inexpensive but you got to do it right mm -hmm. um one thing i really love about reddit uh, as a as a copywriter is that 
if you ever go to go to Reddit, it's considered the front page of the uh, the internet. Mm -hmm. so yeah, it's constantly it's the eighth most visited website in the world. Really, I didn't know that. Oh, interesting. It, it, or uh, it's eighth, or it's it's, it, some, it's, it's up there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. So getting a backlink from Reddit's a big deal. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and they they don't give them away easily. Let's just say that. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so pay close attention to the titles, the way the link, um, how people get you to click the link, because mm -hmm. that's really great copywriting. And in these subreddits, um, like well, there's a welding subreddit. Um, you get to know about the audience, and it's either upvoted or downvoted. Mm -hmm. And the most upvoted will stay at the top of of that subreddit. I don't want to get too technical because I realize <laughs> not everybody's even been to Reddit yet. Sure, sure, I've yeah. For a long time. But basically, you, you can pull copywriting tips, mm -hmm. you can pull content writing tips, as in like, hey, this would actually be a really good content idea that we could, we could write up in a couple of hours and then post because this is clearly questions people are interested in. Okay, so people are posting. I see. Oh, that, that's, that's great. That's a great tip. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what I was doing, uh, and you can also, this is, Kind of a, a gray, well, I guess we'll call it black hat. But <laughs> if, uh, you can pay for about thirty upvotes for like five bucks hmm. using Fiverr. Okay, so yeah. that, that's a great way to get it started in that yeah. subreddit, so that it's already close to the top, so that people are already seeing it. Okay, and you're getting yeah. legitimate real traffic. Yeah, if you're if you're trying to get more exposure on your blog for cheap. Mm -hmm. Inter okay, awesome, interesting. No, this is great. I, I will be the first to admit to you, I am not, I think I've been to Reddit like three times, so I am, sure. do not know how that works. That, this, that's been great. Wow, that's, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, so copywriting tips, uh, you can get cheap traffic that can convert into real leads. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's just also really good to include in your um, distribution st strategy for your yeah. content. Yep. So. That's awesome. I also I love the ability to be able to look at it and kind of uh, you know monitor the questions that people are asking. So that that way, to your point, you can use that to fuel content. Oh, these are what people are asking. Great, let's answer those questions. Let's address that in our content. So exactly, awesome. Yeah. And forums, generally speaking, are just a wonderful place to get um, to get content ideas. Yeah, like I can go to use I'll use my example of LJ Welling because that's that's uh, pretty relatable for some people. Um, there's a, a website called Welding Web, and it's just a forum for welders. Now, this is actually a really great place to find questions that welders are asking each other, mm -hmm. and then you get to see the upvoted um, answers. And those upvoted answers could be excellent blogs on your industrial uh, website. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Things that you know your end users are asking. Yeah. So. Um, if you're ever stuck on content ideas, and then I, I have a few different like free softwares I use to help uh, with keyword research and stuff like that, and um, that uh, I could maybe include uh, in some notes in this, or uh, we could talk about it next time if you want it. Yeah, no, sure, absolutely. Well, I, I, I definitely have my my takeaways and my notes. One of I'm def that's definitely one area I'm going to be checking out this week for sure. <laughs> Take a look at Reddit and you know look at all the information there and. Uh, that definitely yeah, got me excited about that. So um, that that's awesome. So well, again, I'm at this, just so much information you provided for us. I really really appreciate it. Um, again, like I think we definitely will have to have a follow up again later because again, a lot of great information, and you know a lot you know a lot of our audience, we're all going through the same stuff. You know, learning all these different things. Just when you think you got it over here, oh, there's new technology, there's new way of doing oh. this, and so it's it's constant. It's this constant process. Of, Constantly learning, constantly you know, applying new things and testing new things because the things that work today may not work tomorrow. No, they won't. Nope. No. So, it's it's up to us as marketers. Like the like, I remember a, a trick. Maybe some of your your listeners know this one or knew it. Uh, where in Facebook groups you could do a thing called bumping, and yeah. essentially all that was <laughs> was yeah. you would comment. Let's say you posted an article that you wanted people to go. Mm -hmm. uh, read on your website, right. a link in a group, like a, uh, a group that, you know, your, your personas hang out in, mm -hmm. um, you could get it to the top of the group by typing a comment mm -hmm. and in, it in the post to the and top then deleting it. Yeah. and then doing it, uh, putting another comment in, then deleting it because Facebook was only registering that comments were being put in. They weren't noticing that you were deleting the comment. So you may <laughs> yeah. say like, I, 
yeah. enter, comment, delete the comment, hello, enter. And so all these comments, the algorithm was thinking, oh, this is getting this more, is really a popular. Was a, yeah, a lot of traction so, here. And yeah. so that was working for quite a while. And it was a very, very expensive, inexpensive way of getting Facebook traffic to, <laughs> to, to, in fact, it was, it was virtually free. Yeah. But these little marketing tricks that we pick up. Yeah. And I knew about that for a while. And like most marketers don't want to tell other marketers these cool little hacks. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to tell you a few, but um, yeah, these, these things don't last forever. They're, yeah. they're constantly changing. These holes are closing and then new opportunities come up. Yep. So it's up, it's up, up to us as marketers, industrial or whatever, we got to stay up on it. We got to yeah. be listening to podcasts like this um, and, and others out there that are letting us know like better ways of doing things. So we're not reinventing the wheel. We're not wasting time uh, where we could just be looking at best practices with people we trust. Absolutely. Perfect. No. Great, great cap. I appreciate it. Again, thanks for the plug, you know, for pushing, you know, industrial stage. Yeah, you'll listen to this stuff. That's part of what, what we want to do here. So thanks again Absolutely. so much for, for joining us. If, if somebody has a question they want to reach out to you, how, how could they reach you? Um, you could, uh, you could send me a, uh, email at dara at ljwelding.com. Um, I'm on Twitter, uh, but not really, uh, but you <laughs> yeah. can hit me up and, uh, I may respond two months late, but uh, I will. I'll get to it. You can try. Email probably the best way. Okay. Uh, and you feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's Dar Grove White, and uh, just let me know uh, in the uh, ad request where that you you heard from me here, and I'll, uh, I'll I'll link up with you, and you can shoot me a message that way too. So, awesome, great, well. Thanks again for joining us, and um, you know, as always, hopefully you uh, really get, there's a lot of information out of this. I know there's something that you could take away from this, so make sure you, you take this, you take out some of these, these nuggets, this information, and employ them today. You know, if you're not tracking your marketing, if you are not looking, uh, if you're not measuring this stuff, you, you can't improve on it. So make sure, like, at a bare minimum, you're doing that. You know, that that's uh, so important. And we talked about persona development, making sure that everything that you are putting out there really has, there's relevancy and that you're speaking to a particular audience there because they've got that, that the, their particular set of pain points. And now we've talked about that almost on every single episode. It's a little important. So uh, just a lot of great information here again. And so thanks again for watching this episode of Industrial Sage. If, uh, if you liked what you hear, please remember to please subscribe. We've got all this content will be all over on all the social media channels. Like them, share them, get it out there. Uh, if you're listening on iTunes, thanks for listening. We'd love a little uh, review. That'd be awesome. So until next time, enjoy it. And we'll be back next week with another awesome episode. Stanley Gonzalez with Industrial Sage.